Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm John Dickerson. An explosion in Pakistan killed 41 this morning. The Taliban promises more. Revenge for a U.S. missile strike in August that killed one of their top leaders. White House War Council meetings were already tough enough. How does this affect the president's search for a military policy in the region? To discuss the latest, I'm joined by CBS News Washington Bureau Chief Chris Isham and Vanity Fair columnist Christopher Hitchens. Chris Isham, I want to start with you. Four attacks in a week. What's going on in Pakistan? Well, well, clearly this shows that the Taliban have a, a, a quite a substantial capability in the ability to mount these major suicide attacks and bombings uh, throughout the country. Uh, it's a real message that they're trying to send to the government, uh, not only for retaliation, as you mentioned, but also uh, I think they are trying to send a message in advance of an anticipated attack that the Pakistani army is planning in South Waziristan, which is the real the, the, the headquarters of many of the foreign fighters like Al Qaeda and for uh, the hard core of the Taliban. So they're, they're trying to prevent that, I think, in a way of, uh, uh, as this is kind of a shot across the bow, letting Pakistan know what they're capable of, that they can, they, they can cause mass casualties and many, many deaths in these kinds of attacks. Uh, and uh, we'll see whether, uh, whether this causes the Pakistani government or the Pakistani people to, to take another uh, look at whether or not they should be going forward into the, uh, into the tribal areas. Christopher, assess that for me. The people and the military, how fragile are they to this kind of onslaught by the Taliban? Well, you'll note also that this is the week where the Pakistani authorities and media are complaining bitterly that Congress is trying to attach any riders or conditions to the really very generous amounts of aid that we have been giving them more or less unchecked for a very long time. I call your attention to the fact that the, the um, Taliban or whatever this collective name um, for the Islamic uh, fundamentalists is going to be, managed to get inside the Pakistani military HQ. I mean, not, every, not all of your viewers maybe know what Royal Pindi means. I mean, it's like, it would be like uh, saying they got inside West Point or Sandhurst. And remember, it was inside the same place, the Pakistanis military elite HQ that uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was actually found hiding in the house of an officer. So we have every right, I think, to ask the question of wh what's really happening to our, our aid money and to the political alliance that goes with it. In other words, are the Pakistanis really sincere about doing this or are they only doing the minimum? Right. Uh, Chris Aisham, I want to switch to Afghanistan, which is the big question on the plate for the president. You've talked to the administration. Um, Give us what they're saying and also how this might play into the president's deliberations on Afghanistan. Well, I think the, uh, the impression I'm getting, and this is still very fluid and they're still, uh, they're still involved in these series of very high-level meetings involving the president, National Security Council, his top advisors, uh, and uh, they, they had, they had uh, one last week. At the end of last week, uh, expect they'll have another one or two this week. Um, so it's still very much a work in progress. But the, the sense that I'm getting from some of the folks we've been talking to over there is that there is a real effort to try to, uh, what they call, disaggregate uh, Al-Qaeda from the Taliban. That uh, they want to make it clear that there, are, that there are two different networks and two different organizations requiring different tools uh, to approach them. And, and I think this is something that, uh, that we're hearing more and more of and that perhaps this may, uh, we may see uh, something of a backing off of a full-scale counterinsurgency uh, strategy that, uh, that the president uh, uh, talked about back in March. What do you make of that, Christopher, this, this attempt to separate the Taliban and al-Qaeda? Well, it's an old story. We've been, when the Taliban were in power in Afghanistan, even before uh, the attack on our civil society in September of 2001, we kept saying, would you mind giving up Mr. Bin Laden or moving him out of there? Um, and they wouldn't do it then, and they wouldn't do it after 2001, which is why we removed them. I'm myself a bit skeptical. There is, of course, a difference, but I'm not sure how much of a distinction there is to be made between the two of them. The one is certainly the environment for the other. Ideologically, they're quite similar. And in any case, if the Taliban was to take over any part of any country, that, that region or that country would itself immediately become a failed state, as well as a rogue one. Uh, often the failed state is the precondition for the roguery. Mm -hmm. So we'd be back to the same generation of the same phenomenon, um, albeit uh, in a different form. In your assessment, Christopher, of Afghanistan, there, the other argument, you know, John McCain said if, if the president doesn't accept this troop increase, it will be a mistake of historic proportions. This notion that basically all of Afghanistan has to be pacified. Is that your view? Is, can Afghanistan be a smaller 
um, uh, operation uh, or, or maybe an operation without this increase in troops? Well, look, there's never been an Afghan government that's controlled all of Afghanistan. I mean, I don't think there's ever been one in history. Certainly the Taliban didn't control right. all of it. I mean, you don't have to control all of it to have a lot of influence on it. Okay, it's possible that the footprint could be less heavy. I was very interested to see in this morning's New York Times, in the very last paragraph of all, I would call it a buried lead, Richard Holbrook saying, maybe we should stop burning their poppy crop, since it's the only thing most of them can grow. Maybe that hasn't really worked. Maybe we overestimated the extent to which that was being used by the Taliban. Maybe we've alienated the whole farming class. Well, I think that shows there's a mind at work somewhere at the administration. Yeah, but it's only at the end of the story that you get to it. And that would be a major reversal of U.S. policy if that were what we were... Yes, it would. Uh, the spirit of Richard Nixon, who launched the war on drugs, still lives. I think it's the only part of his policy that we're still wedded to. <laughs> Let me just say, uh, in addition to that, I think that the... Um, the I, I was in, Talib I was in uh, Afghanistan in, in 2000, when the Taliban were in power. And uh, they were... Uh, uh, the one thing that I, I think came away from that was that the, the people were terrified of the Taliban. Um, and I think that even today, you find most people, they know the Taliban. And the Taliban ruled with a, with a uh, iron fist uh, and through sheer terror. Mm -hmm. um, the women were forced back in their houses. I mean, it was, it was a rule of terror. Mm -hmm. And most Afghans don't want to see them come back into power. And that, that's a major advantage that we have going into this, that 